Couldn't happen zusammen. While in my bed a few nights ago, I was still ruminating that doing a wall video on Tremor or Poise would be too much for too little. But then an idea came to my mind. Let's just do a wall analysis of all main statuses archetypes at once. And so here we are. In this video, I'll make a bit more in-depth analysis of each status with how they work, advantages and convenience, their uses, their current states, and a few ideas of how to deepen the mechanics. But first, what are the statuses concerned? Well, the seven main ones in the game, slightly associated with the seven sins. Burn, Bleed, Tremor, Rupture, Sinking, Poise, and Charge. Each of those appear on different groups of units and define the main archetypes. That doesn't mean they are the only mechanics that makes an archetype, like aggro can make a tank, or ammo a broken unit. However, they are common synergistic statuses that build around the core gameplay mechanic, crushing your enemies. Some do better, some do worse, but all have this goal. So let's just jump into it. For the order, let's do it in the same order as the rainbow colored scenes they are associated with. So let's start with burn. The description says, at the end of the turn, take fixed damage by the effect's potency, then reduce its count by one. The simplest effect. A good introduction to statuses in general, which have a number for the potency and one for the count, which functions in two different ways. Let's start by the most obvious, the disadvantages. The burn process is a slow one. Contrary to most other damage statuses that can proc multiple times a turn, burn can only apply once at the end, making it way slower in its application. And as we know, in this game, speed is everything. Not only because of most unlocks being speedrun based, but also because the best way to avoid damage in this game, outside of preventing the opponents to attack by clashing or staggering, is to kill them. So the faster, the better. And burn is inherently slow. Now, burn has multiple advantages because of it. The first one is, it is very easy to use. Because the count is slow to drop, burn status is very easy to maintain. Another advantage is that it is not affected by resistance, meaning you can use it anywhere, so it is way simpler to use. And that's actually it. Burn is a very simple and effective status, albeit slow. Unfortunately, an hidden problem of most statuses, but especially relevant for this one, is the maximum limit. Each status has its potency and count capped at 99. It's really relevant, but for burn, since the count is not as important as the potency, meaning that you want to increase potency a lot more, it becomes very relevant. Because of this and the slow damage, one way you want to use it is to apply it on the most target possible at once, especially on multiple abnormality parts, as all parts inflict damage to the core individually. Unfortunately as of now, this is barely possible, as only egos have AoE burn, and the application can be limited and barely worth using them to increase damage. Though Ryoshu for Smash Flame is very good, but it's an exception. The bigger problem is the lack of IT support. Burn system makes it so any form of potency applied is worth, so the number of IDs does matter a lot, but there isn't enough to fill a team of 7 yet, barely 5. And even then, to accelerate the process of killing enemies, IDs have barely any mechanics related to the burn outside of current power increase. Liu Ishmael is the only one with damage increase depending on burn applied. The worst part though is that it is based on burn count, the number from the two that you care less about. It does increase the IDs complexity though I guess, but there would be other ways to increase burn damage, or related mechanics. The most obvious way is doing like Seeking Deluge, but for burn, so it all explodes at once. Boring, but highly efficient to speed up the process. Burn is also assimilated to explosions, so a good similar application would be some form of status like Powder, which explodes when a significant amount of burn is applied, potentially dealing AoE damage. Speaking of AoEs, as I said it would be very valuable, so taking back a page from Runa, Something similar to Force of a Wildfire would be a welcomed addition to increase the AOA application, and specializing burn into a more spreading kind of status, which would give it a lot more interest. Now, let's take a look at Bleed. It says, when tossing an attack coin, take fixed damage by the effect's potency, then reduce its count by one. More complex than burn. You'll notice the attack coin mention. Counts both in clashes and attacks, but in clashes, while rolling multiple coins at once, it only procs once. Bleed has the advantage, like burn, of being non-resistance based. 
so usable anywhere. It can proc multiple times per turn, and probably more times than other statuses if very efficiently managed. However, this makes it also much harder to use, not only because count can rapidly diminish, but also because it is very dependent on clashes, so dependent on probabilities of con rolls. You can let yourself get hit, but that would mean you needing to tank. If you are using defensive skills, you're then not applying count, meaning the bleeding potential is stopping. Overall, you probably want to stack it on one part, and being careful of focusing the one with the most attacks. Since it's also relying on the opponent's attacks rather than your own, you either need extensive knowledge about your opponent's behavior for proper application, or roll the dice. In the end, you want to apply a steady stream of count while avoiding the enemy running out of count. This means that most clashes have to be won, or your ID is tanking one-sided attacks. After that, if you want the hemorrhage to quickly drain your opponent's HP, as I mentioned in my railway video, a good way would be to lose a clash with a good number of coins, so the enemy has to roll theirs as many times as your coins and their coins. So for example, with Sushev Gregor, losing with skills 3 would make the bleeding proc 4 times, plus the number of enemy coins. This can quickly drain an enemy's HP in exchange for your own, though. Right now, Bleed is in a not optimal but okay position, I'd say. The archetype got lots of supports at the beginning of the game, making it kinda reliable. The nail status also increasing count is useful, even if it can be a bit clunky or slow, the best way to maintain count probably still being direct counter addition, like Kurokumo Ryoshu, Ukofi Songlu, and especially Arc or Mersault. The biggest problem though, is a lack of interesting bleed egos. A few do inflict some good bleed potency, but the only mainly interesting one, especially for count, is Legia Domain, with Maggots inflicting bleed count at the end of each turn. A stronger ego completing the archetype would be appreciated. Another way to make the archetype interesting would be some form of statuses related to bleed, like wounds, that could increase the count each time the opponent receives an attack, or each time it deals one to recycle the count. The latter would be quite powerful, so it could be ego-locked, like with Runa's Sanguine Desire. Outside of that, I don't think the status needs much more. It is another PM classic, and don't need to get more complicated than it already is here. Next, Tremor. Oh boy, this is gonna be a long one. Ayin says, when attacked by skills that burst Tremor, raise the stagger threshold by the effect's potency. At the end of the turn, reduce the count by 1. Fitting for Sloth. If you don't proc it manually, it does nothing. The main advantage of this status is probably that it's the only one directly impacting stagger thresholds, which could lead to interesting situations. Unfortunately, the more complex ones could lock other archetypes, so it's probably best to not go in this direction. Well, that's it for the advantages. Now for the inconvenience. Everything else. Okay, let's be more specific. The biggest problem of Tremor is that it doesn't do anything by itself. I'm not only talking about bursting it. I'm saying that you could burst it 2000 times without ever inflicting damage. I know that they released Molarotis and Regret Faust, but they are damaged based on its potency. It does not change the mechanic in itself. They are more using it like charge. Which is probably why they actually went into that kind of direction with the false charge. The second biggest problem, linked with the first, is about the game mechanics and how stagger and thresholds work. Once stagger thresholds are gone, that's it. Your tremor application officially became useless, which is why they actually went with a regret more salt when realizing that. The worst part is that, in Runa, tremor could have been broken. Imagine. Each time the enemy recovers from stagger, hopla, no more stagger gauge. And so you lock him into an infinite stagger loop. Fun? Okay, let's be real though, most times they were staggered, they died anyway. In Limbo though, most body parts do not recover once broken, except for a few exceptions, like the Pekatulae, aka the less relevant ones anyway. So again, if there are no more stagger threshold, it's useless. If the body part is broken, it's useless, for the same reason. Want more? Well, stagger and HP are directly linked. How does that matter? That means that staggering the enemy is already linked to the amount of damage you're doing. Meaning that there is no distinction between choosing types and affinities for stagger or HP, like in Runa. So while you spend a few turns supposedly sacrificing damage for Tremor, you can probably stagger the enemy in the same amount of time by just dealing efficient damage. The end result would be that they would get staggered, 
But in one case, they would have lost a quarter of their life, while on the other, they would be at half HP. But Magnet isn't that the same for other statuses. The problem, my self friend, is, outside of fun, the principle of snowballing. You are accumulating statuses, so you can inflict more damage by the end than you would with raw damage. But that's not the case for Tremor. As I said, it becomes irrelevant late fights. It is a early fight mechanic that you need to build. This feels very counterintuitive. The whole process of building it up, then manually triggering it in itself is slightly tedious, for an underwhelming reward. If you do fights that rest on this mechanic, that means that raw damage becomes unplayable, so in Gacha it's hardly possible. I could fall on Gacha's design matters, but let's go back with the last disadvantage, the current state. Yes, because they actually spent most of season 2 trying to support the archetype. The best they could do is with Mora Otis, but that's mainly thanks to Discord, and Regret Faust, but that's mainly because of AoEs. They don't make Tremor strong, they are strong, and Tremor is a slight boost, as other units bursting Tremor don't profit from it. Outside of that, they probably realized the mechanic is hard to build upon in this context, so they ended up using it as a charge more than anything really, and to add more impression of it being useful. Tremor Egos 2 are barely non-existent. Regret Mersault is interesting, but again, it doesn't make Tremor strong. It is strong, and Tremor is a boost. The worst part is probably how they kept adding effects to reduce Tremor count when bursting. The statues could have had the advantage of having easy management, but they decided that no. So, is Tremor doomed? Not really. A rework would be very appreciated though. The minimum would be that bursting it inflicts damage if there is no more threshold. That would be the bare minimum instead of just putting this effect on new ideas. But even then, the game itself already had good ideas to make it interesting. In Kento 4, a certain enemy has two statuses that were never reused. Resonant, which does inflict damage when bursting Tremor, also upgrading Stagger Threshold Increase, and Tremor Sync, reducing opponent's clash power when they have too much Tremor. Those are good effects which, if put on enemies, can give strong incentive to build Tremor, and making it useful even without stagger thresholds. And don't tell me they can't, we have Gaze on Grip Faust. A Tremor Deluge would also obviously give the same type of late fight damage potential. Let's go on to the following one. Rupture. The prescript says, when hit by an attack, take fixed damage by the effect's potency, then reduce its count by one. The archetype of damage status is archetypes. Rupture is simple in theory. Hit a target, inflict rupture, and keep inflicting it faster than you hit the enemies. This becomes an adventure when half of the skills will not replenish any bit of rupture count. Even more so when you also have to increase potency while draining count. So that's the first inconvenient. It can become really hard to manage. The reason it is a disadvantage is because you might get very awkward setups, and you will have to slow down your rupture factory so it doesn't blow up, which can also mean letting attack pass to not hit the opponent and everything else. But the good thing is, unlike bleeding, you have a lot more control over both your infliction and the triggerings, so you don't get screwed by coin rolls, at least not more than usual. Rupture also has the usual advantage of being reliable on every opponent. The last benefit I list is that, because of the other two advantages, it's inherently a reliable damage addition to your attacks. As long as you maintain it and keep it growing, you will get a bigger and bigger damage output after every hit, which has an incredible snowball potential. Because it is linked to your attacks, let's say that it has the disadvantage of needing your attacks to hit, so you can't let it run out alone when built, but it's not that big of a problem. Rupture is a status that you want to keep stacking on one focused opponent or body part. You just maintain its count while applying more, and that's about it. Pretty simple overall. Right now, quite a bit of ideas have rupture inflection, and a few egos can help a lot with the count, mainly Ebony Stem and Dimension Shredders. The question is, why isn't Rupture popping off then? Well, simple. Maintaining the count is hard. Really. I did say it was, and that's especially true right now. Because it has so much potential, PM has been pretty careful to not overclock the Rupture count inflection, so it doesn't just maintain it by itself. IDs have been coming out with some inflection, especially W Copy Sang, but even then, they barely maintain the count by themselves. With the egos, it becomes way more feasible, but that opens the other problem of needing to use them. So you need resources, 
want to set up a passive sanity drop, yada yada. So what could we do more with this status? Well, first of course, increasing the number of IDs to maintain the count, but this will happen. And with them, the snowball potential of rupture will just become more and more clear. That's fun already, but let's think of other things. Outside of infliction, I mean. Talismans are already a very good idea. Well, to separate it from its gloomier sibling, we could have some status which sticks to the meaning of rupture and deal damage to several body parts at the same time, for example. I won't mention rupture deluge for obvious reasons. But outside of that, rupture is already a nice status with high potential, so I don't think it needs more gimmicks. That doesn't mean it wouldn't be cool, especially since the archetype really lacks some form of interesting gimmick outside the talisman, and there are already a ton of ideas inflicting some rupture somewhere more or less good. But then, we have the cooler sibling, Sinking. The Wheel of the City says, when hit by an attack, take fixed SP damage by the effect's potency. Units with no sanity take gloom damage instead. Then reduce its count by one. So it's either a gloom rupture or an actual sanity modifier. Let's go quickly through the former. It has pretty much the same advantages and disadvantages as rupture. The main point of difference is the gloom affinity, which can either be a blessing or a curse. This does mean more variation, so I'll put it in disadvantage. But to be fair, right now it isn't. Because there are no null gloom resistance nor absorption, and because of how the affinities match up work. I won't enter into details about this again. But about its other usage, sanity depletion. Unfortunately, most boss fights don't care about this, but let's imagine they do. Like Railway 2 Station 4. Panic can have some really strong effects, which can make you win the fight outright. Because of that, sanity reduction is an advantage. Adding to that, with it being linked to coin rolls, it gives you way better probabilities, making your plays more constant. The disadvantages would be, outside of the rupture disadvantage of being a hard management, the lack of snowball potency. Like Tremor, when they are in panic, sinking has done its job, and you can't use it anymore really. It is not that much of a deal compared to Tremor, for the main reason that panic seems stronger than stagger, especially since recovering from it is impossible and it can actually stagger. There is also the current reason that there is no real boss with sanity anyway, so it's a non-issue and abnormalities shouldn't have a sanity ever. Maybe some exceptions in the future, but probably not before a while. Now for its current state. Well, it is eating good. ID-wise, a lot of high count inflections have been released, though IDs inflicting sinking tend to have high coin rolls also, so it kinda compensates. However, ego-wise, Rimeshank exists, and is still one of the best egos in the game right now, inflicting unacceptable amounts of both potency and count in an AoE meaning you can make multiple opponents panic at once in normal encounter. The passive also cripples the opponent, just as a much needed bonus. Without it, it does become way trickier though. Now, as for what we can do with this status. Sanity-wise, well, sinking deluge already exists. I don't think making it deal damage naturally when the sanity is at minus 45 is wise though, as it would become way too strong. Overall though, since his name is sinking, adding some statuses crippling the opponents when enough is applied would be a nice specialty, like for example a water gauge of some sort. Outside of that, like Rupture, the statue is bound to snowball out of control anyway, so it doesn't need anything. But that's not because it doesn't need anything that it will be nice seeing something. So, about poise. PM says, on hit, gain a potency-based change to deal critical damage, reducing the count by 1 if successful. At the end of the turn, reduce the count by 1. Let's talk quickly about critical hits and gains. Critical hits are a mechanic designed to increase damage dealer's damage output by having a random chance to deal more damage. In most gachas, this equals a crit percent chance of doubling damage or even more. The goal is then to find the right balance between increasing critical percent chance and attack when customizing your units. Lembus decided to put all of that in the bin, linking crit chance to a status and making the damage modifier 20%. Okay, so first, the obvious one. 20% for a crit? I'm building wall as archetype for a 20% damage bonus? So low damage is already the first disadvantage. Second, 5% chance per stack, up to 20, and you can get more. Why not? But why is my count depleting so fast? Losing one count per crit? Fair. Losing one count at the end of the turn? 
also fair. Maybe generous, even. But not both at the same time! So second disadvantage, keeping the count is an horrendous journey. Even more so since if you lose it, you lose all your quick chance. Period. Third disadvantage, well it's random, so variation. Unreliable. Get it? That would be enough for the disadvantages. Now for the advantages. I'm struggling here. It's fun and getting a crit with the effect is satisfying. That's hardly an advantage. Let's say, since it's a damage increase and the multiplier is in the static multiplier phase, it can counteract resistances or high defenses and does add to the ID strengths that are using it, whichever it is. For its usage, well, theoretically you would build it and then unleash a flurry of crit attacks on your opponents. It's a self status, so it's just self count management. But since it is random, it is unpredictable. Funnily enough, the current state isn't as critical as one might think. Thank you. Because they have cranked up the passives very hard. Between giving huge crit damage bonuses to IDs specializing in it, or insane passives increasing power by a metric ton, they have tried their best. Poise IDs have limited coin numbers too, easing poise management. Some crit effects can also be very potent, like Otis Sun Shower, though there isn't any other poise egos. Before going into random thoughts, I'd like to precise that, unlike the previous ones, poise is a selfish status. It applies to the user, and only to them. All the crit bonuses can help the individual IDs, but doesn't increase the status potential itself. Any team application is then very weird. They try to do something with Sinclair's passive to give synergy, but that's limited. The Alisang support is the only thing close to poise's, well, support. But with latest IDs, I think I'm starting to get a grip on what PM is trying to accomplish. Poise being a status that anyone can get, to avoid giving everyone potential broken crits, they decided to limit the potential to specialized IDs by only letting them have bonus on crit damage. This anchors poise as a selfish status only worth on some units. Therefore, poise should not be seen as a team archetype, but as a maker of individual strong ID, the type you can put one of in any team, especially if it has mixed synergy. So they are pretty much going similar to the charge way. The best demonstration for this probably being Svyrogen. However, let's imagine what could have been done to make it more synergic and more usable like other archetypes. What to do to help this poor little fella? What could be done to increase team synergy, outside of ego gifts obviously, would be giving some kind of status to the opponent they can all benefit from. I've thought of something quite fun. Let's take back smoke from Runa. Yeah, no, not literally. Let's make it a status that increases crit damage taken by the count, with it being reduced by one either at the end of the turn or when taking a crit, but not both. I think it'd make for a nice team synergy. What the status would really need is a rework. Outside of removing one of the contradiction condition, giving it some additional effects. I thought for example of potency also increasing the crit damage modifier. For example, 1% per potency, or like 2 or 3% for any potency above 20. Because having over 20 potency is also useless. Also, as another mention, doing something like a critical miss for enemies where they inflict less damage would also be an idea. Also, some ego to give team wide poise would be a nice addition, or just plainly increasing the crit damage modifier. And finally, like a warp train, we arrive at charge. Carmen says, Resource used by certain skills for additional effects. Its count can go up to 20. Count lowers by 1 at the end of each turn. Ok, so let's get the first disadvantage out of the way. Charge, by itself, does nothing. Like poise, it is a very selfish status, and only benefits the owner, so it is just based on the owner's strength. The main advantage is, because you just lose 1 at the end of the turn, it is very easy to manage. And at the end. The status in itself is useless, it just serves the IDs. As for its usage, stack it on yourself and then consume it with the proper skills or egos. As for the current state... Eh, maybe because it is incredibly simple and easy, they decided to put it everywhere for all archetypes as a setup tool. W Corp being popular from Ruina likely does not help and Hard Corp won't help either later. They also used it for increasing general damage and those are some of the strongest IDs in the game right now, like W Dawn or Ryoshu. There are also a lot of egos using it, in better or worse ways, and there is even Don's Telepole replenishing the team. 
The status is well cherished. Not even counting Tremor that decided to try and also get the glory. Yes, the status needs pretty much no explanation, so let's think of better stuff to do with it. Since it doesn't do anything, let's invent a way to make it do something. Let's introduce a battery status effect, apply it on an opponent, and let's increase its count when attacked by a unit with charge by the charge amount. Consuming charge is optional. Then let's make this battery do anything, like increasing damage taken, deal damage, increase crit damage if you want to fancy poise energy, whatever you want, and then decrease its count by X at the end of the turn or whenever. This seems to me like an actually interesting addition to a status that doesn't do anything. Another way would look like a lightning pulse status that inflicts damage when hit by a charge on it. There are a lot of possibilities. However, they decided to make charge a setup status, making the ID pretty strong in return, which also means that any addition of the sort could upset the already fragile balance of the game, creating a new judgment bird. That's it for the statuses by themselves. As a final part, let's talk about them together. They try to mix statuses in weird ways already, like Encorp Sinclair mixing Bleed and Burn, Sunshower is Cliff Rupture in Thinking, Slushing Ishmael and Rose Spawner Gregor with Tremor and Rupture, and Charge with everything. Notice something? Outside of Charge, it doesn't work. It's not enough. Most of them have one application, said application being more or less useful. It can bring members fitting several archetypes, but like, I wouldn't bring Sancho Escliffe to a Rupture team. I know what you're thinking, but I could still bring him to a sinking team. To be fair, mixing the statuses don't seem like a good idea, as it would often give more underwhelming ideas in either of them, or both. You would rather capitalize on one status. There could be some ways still. If you're thinking of situations like for Railway 2 buffs when you can have multiple statuses stacking, I guess there are situations where you could combine them. For example, statuses which could convert one into the other, or one increasing the other's strength. Charge works fine because it's a resource status, so it naturally mixes well. Fitting for the status of Envy to take other archetypes, boys can too, but managing it is way more hellish. As a conclusion, I'd like you to remember when this video is released, especially if you're watching it in a few weeks, because the situation of the statuses will change. What will change mostly is that PM will keep adding supports for all archetypes, and the main reason some work better than others is still because we are not even a year into the game. In a year from now, I do expect all archetypes to have received lots of support and also massive power creep. But that's for another video. For now, let's hope we don't get more than 2 or 3 charge IDs by the end of the year, for the sake of a lot of people's sanity. And that concludes this video. Final message, Canto 5 is going, and I'm praying for a sea shanty by the end of it. If it's also the new melee song, you might hear a scream around part 3 release. Mine. In any case, see you next time, and keep your sanity high in this slow descent into the inferno.